Okay, uh, thanks for sticking with us and welcome to the last session. Because uh, we're short on time, I'll let any, each of the presenters introduce themselves. They're already in the program. Uh, my name is Brant Houston. I'm the chair of the, um, the Global Investigative uh, Network, which is a network of about 150 nonprofit newsrooms around the world uh, that do investigative reporting. I'm also the night chair in investigative reporting at the University of Illinois. And before that, I ran investigative reporters and editors. So investigative is, uh, goes with my name all the time. And I was an investigative reporter and still do some editing. So we're going to um, go through things fairly rapidly because we want to have some questions and answers. And I just wanted to set the stage a little bit with just four, screen, four uh, websites. Okay, can you set that up for me? Okay. Um, so the first one here, and I wanted to tag into the last uh, session. I think it's great to have a little coherence in our program. We were talking a lot about digital advertising, print advertising, and, and supporting uh, good reporting. One of the stories that just came out this past week is about investigative reporting at the Washington Post. And Marty Barron, who is the editor there, famous from a movie now, said investigative reporting is absolutely critical to our business model. We add value. We tell people what they didn't already know. We hold government, powerful people, and institutions accountable. This cannot happen without financial support. We're at a point where the public realizes that and is willing to step up and support that work by buying subscriptions. He said digital subscriptions had soared this week in the wake of the latest Russian revelations. Uh, we'll go to um, another paragraph in here. Investigative journalism also drives advertising, Mr. Hartman said. Um, and then at the very bottom, there's an analyst who says the future for newspapers is in really the production of high quality, um, high end quality journalism. So that's one thing I wanted to touch on. Um, so we start maybe with a little bit of hope. And now if we can go to the next one. I think you started the conference. A lot of people have talked about this. Um, but this shows the new kinds of journalism uh, tremendous collaboration across borders that gives us quite a bit of hope. Um, I also wanted to show a network that began in the United States in 2009 that is yet another group of nonprofit newsrooms that are in this organization, this network, looks at coming up with business practices to sustain those organizations. Sustainability is our big word. And last of all, there's the Global Investigative Journalism Network, which Yetta and others and Berto are quite familiar with. So again, uh, we, some of the answer may be in networks and collaborations, but we'll start to explore that. And now we'll go, if we can hit transparency, we'll go to Roberto and his concept for this panel and some of the concerns he has. Okay, turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for everybody. Uh, before I start, um, I want to say something. I am a Mexican, and I came uh, to this Congress really, really heartbroken by the recent killing of a, of a fellow journal, um, Javier Valdez. And I would like to put on record that uh, the killings of journalists in Mexico has become an endless, an endless tragedy, all of them with impunity. And just as I'm saying this, uh, I have been recently told by somebody in Twitter that uh, another journalist, which I don't know, called Salvador Adame, has just been kidnapped and has been disappeared for two days. And of course, the odds are that he's going to be killed again uh, as well. Sorry. Um, I will really ask to, for everybody to just reflect a little bit on the situation that is going on in Mexico that has started many, many years ago and that uh, have meant that Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries on the planet to do investigative journalism and journalism in general, particularly when you are uh, doing investigations around corruption and drugs and drug trafficking. So, I mean, I think this is very important for me to say. Um, having said that, um, part of the reflection of this, of this panel is about uh, our experience as an advocacy NGO that um, we rely on news and investigative journalism to do our work. 
we cannot just go around saying this is bad and this is good and trying to come up with a, you know policy recommendations and all the boring things that we the advocates do uh, without news and of course as investigative journalism has become more central to uncovering corruption news pretty much Panama Papers is the, the biggest case or biggest example that we can see now our job depends fully of good investigative journalism but still we be, I believe that there's still a bit of a gap in terms of the capacity to follow up and have a, what I would call a systemic impact uh, in order to kind of a curb corruption. And systemic impact means going beyond the breaking news, going beyond bringing one or two uh, prime ministers or presidents or corrupt down, possibly to jail. It's about changing the rules of the game in societies and in governments. Because what we have seen over and over again is that after a big scandal happens, basically the system is able to reaccommodate itself and that the rules of the game remain. So the question and why we are here is about how we can bring uh, greater collaborative models so that advocates, civil society in general, but fundamentally, we can work more with investigative journalists. A very last reflection uh, that I want to make, so that to give the floor, is that usually NGOs are pretty slow. We depend on donations, we have yearly programs, yearly plans, and sometimes when the news break, our capacity to react is pretty slow. Potentially, we may only be able to do one of our typical press releases saying this is horrible, this is bad, but we are unable to shift gears and try to engage systematically on the things that are being uncovered. This is changing for the good because now we are uh, collaborating more uh, with investigative journalists, but the question here is about how we could actually work together to make sure that the rules of the game are changed in for a long-term perspective. Thank you. So, yet are you all set? <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Yeta Zora. I'm, for the last 12 years, I run a um, current affairs program in Kosovo called Life in Kosovo. Um, and uh, my story is actually starts from the very question of uh, this panel. I was started working for the BBC as a fixer, started my career as a fixer, and uh, uh, worked uh, for the BBC in the World Service, and I was very frustrated that I was having no effect with my journalism. So in 2004, I decided to go back to Kosovo and um, and and see some change happen from the journalism I do. And I started to figure out what, what can I do to, to impact people's lives. And the biggest problem in Kosovo when I, when I arrived in 2004 in a post-war Kosovo was the, the energy blackouts. We had four hours electricity on, four off. And I started digging why we have so little energy. And, it, and one of the reasons why we did was because people didn't pay their bills. Because during Milosevic era, former Yugoslavia, one way the citizens of Kosovo were, uh, uh, Kosovo Albanians were resisting um, the, the state was by not paying the bills. It was part of the peaceful resistance. While the wars were happening, happening in former Yugoslavia, uh, uh, the, people, the people invented, they, they didn't want to go to war for, for 10 years because we saw the consequence of the war, but we developed a system of resisting the state. Not paying the bills was one of the ways. But in post-war Kosovo, this was causing like the main element uh, of statehood. Like, just, just, just living uh, with electricity and water wasn't there. So um, there was an election uh, coming up, and the election was about mayor elections. I, was, I, I wanted to do election debates in every town, but although it was a mayor election, um, I saw that I had, to inter I had to get the promises. If you had to go to every single town in Kosovo, there were 30, and if you wanted to get promises, election debates for every single candidate, there were 300 of them. And I thought I'll start asking the energy company whether the 300 candidates for mayors have paid their energy bills. I tested it out. Uh, this was an era where most of the people who were running for election was former, were former guerrillas, people I had met as a fixer during the war and who, who didn't want to be challenged, but I thought, hey, I know these guys. I can ask them the question. I know these guys from the war. I brought them with the BBC cameras. What's the problem of asking them about energy, energy bills? So um, 
we started it off like that and also, I mean, uh, before I'll show you the video of their reaction, but uh, just you have to have in mind that I had to spend a year convince, uh, a few months convincing uh, the head of uh, the public TV to air these debates because it, he thought this is kind of journalism that uh, a 40,000 people town, 30 towns, who cares about every single town? Just do the big towns. In the end, I got 11.30, 23.30 at night uh, schedule to air these for, for mainly him to get rid of me uh, after me begging for three months to do this. So let's see the reaction. Um, I would like uh, you to help me to play the reaction of the people that I asked of energy bills and I'll tell you what happened afterwards. Ju tha që ju e një ekspert të tas janë. Tregoni tash eksperta ta e paguin rrymën. E paguin, besoj, si masë... Ju, a e paguin i ju rrymën. Zëni Qaka, a paguin i ju rrymën? E paguin. Zëni Zharko? Bile avanci ja, po më sepse u dhejt një fabrik. Avanci e pni. Mlejoni, mlejoni shikut në dërum, ju që jeni në sol edhe ju që nga shikoni. Zëni Zharku, ju keni borsh 2934 euro pik të të fesë cent. Zëni Zharka, ju që e paguni me po të qartë thatë, ju i keni borsh 5.570 euro pik të 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 cent. Zëni i Krivanjeva që tha dhe këtë po sigurt e ka 838 euro pik të 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 The good side of that was there was a rise of 40% in paying the bills after the campaign since this went on every night. Of course, the per first person who called me and uh, was the head of TV who was, who was uh, uh, n resisting me to play this program, who said I had to pay my bills when you started showing this. Uh, yes, live. So in every town, we went every night and in every town, they'd come back with then the day after with the bills paid. They said, okay, I sent my wife yesterday. It wasn't paid, but they paid afterwards. Okay, this made them, uh, so what's the message of being effective? Uh, I was uh, spending so much time in the rest of the program to, to, to scrutinize political, uh, to research and scrutinize political party programs, but people just came to watch, like with popcorns, just came to watch this part. This made them uh, popular in order to get them to, to, to get them hooked to the format. What format? The format was, I filmed the promises of each mayor and I would come back, this was 2007, 10 years ago. In the middle of each mandate, I'd come back to every single town, play the tape, it was, um, if we start showing the, uh, the, the, so this was the format where we'd put uh, a screen on, on the same hole when they made the promise. We would play back the tape and measure the promise, how much had they met. In the beginning, of course, they lied a lot because nobody believed we we're gonna come back. We've done three elections, three election debates, and three post-election debates. This is what I guess the answer is about being, uh, if you don't follow up on your own story, who else is gonna follow up on your story? If you don't nurture your own story, if you don't care, and this is why I think my, uh, our type of journalism survives today and donors want to pay it uh, because it's rooted, basically I see it as rooted in the audience and I call it engaged journalism. Uh, I will come back and I will play the tape over and over and nobody, no, none of the national TVs want to do this. Uh, they find in the beginning that was the mentality. Why would you go to every single town? Why does every single town deserve uh, us uh, investment in crews and, and doing it live and doing it in small towns? Because I only felt then because it's where no, uh, the audience is where uh, is the least tended to, and, and the, the credibility was, was built like that year on and year out. However, that's the good side of the story, that we had an effect. The bad side of the story, <laughs> the, the, the not so good side of the story, is of course I was challenging every year as I was coming back, I was challenging people who were former guerrillas, who just wouldn't, wouldn't take it. They thought they were uh, beyond the law, and uh, when I did one of the mayors in the main KLA heartland, Kosovo Liberation Army heartland, 
um, and, and scrutinize how he said he will spend his funds and where he actually and how he spent the funds uh, on, on uh, and discovered some uh, uh, misuse of public funds, a campaign started. A campaign of, uh, of vilif uh, vilifying me and my, my team every day for 10 days in, in the main tabloid newspaper. And the main tabloid headlines, the trick was for them to put it on the headlines so they could be read before evening news. So they all paid advertising and on evening news, uh, before the evening news in, in, in the most watched uh, part, they said that I'm, I'm a spy for Serbia. That um, um, that all this, the, these my investigations have been uh, cooked in in Belgrade, and somebody should put me in my place. And that the name of my program is Life in Kosovo. They said that I had shortened my life with the program I did in Life in Kosovo. So um, the the members of of my team started getting car accidents, a lot under pressure. The local uh, police and courts didn't dare to do anything to this man, to the point that okay. Uh, to cut the long story short, um, the campaign uh, brought us down to five years later, us taking them to court and uh, losing the case. Losing the case on the basis that an international judge, an EU judge, thought in the end that all the threats, the words of threatening, are not physical threat. If, since, since we're alive, um, they, they're all right to threaten. However, this was, in, of course, in a period where Serbia, everybody knew somebody who had been killed in the war. And, uh, but today, what can I say? Today, we continue to do these programs while the person we went to court with, this man who threatened me, uh, he's in jail for war crimes. So sooner or later, he was, he was caught for, uh, for something else. I guess um, to... to, to um, really summarize what uh, my uh, the answers to do investigative journalists stick with the story long enough to have an impact. Maybe those of us that that do and had an impact, I want to just share with you what I would say the lessons learned. First, is that of course, of course, uh, this proves that I, you do have to work on stories and themes that interest. Uh, used strategically. I chose to deal with local election because nobody else was doing it. And, um, but the side, side lesson in, in this for me was that uh, I, I, uh, I wish somebody would have told me then that I need to pace myself because I thought the wartime reporting, nothing could get worse than that, that dealing with Milosevic, paramilitaries, massacres, and nobody prepared me mentally. I went through hostile environment courses uh, with, with uh, big media, flat jackets. I thought nothing can be worse than that. A post-war peacetime reporting had ended up to be something nobody prepared me for. So um, it's, a, it's a sort of cat and mouse game that I wish I'd known to pace myself better, not to... Uh, uh, not to completely be, um, be mentally unprepared for what happened and dealing with uh, former lord, warlords and, and freedom, in fact, freedom fighters, those who were freedom fighters for me to turn out to be corrupt politician, politicians. So, but, but consistency means that those people would end up the, the, the same way we work uh, because we live in communities which are interconnected and especially where I live, two million people. I always have to count that the, the next mayor is the next minister, the next uh, oligarch. So uh, being consistent with following someone's career is as well, you as a journalist, it pays off uh, going for the same story because the people that we're investigating stay, uh, stay, stay the same. Second lesson, I guess, uh, that I'd like to share with you in doing this effective and, and very focused uh, investigation is freedom of speech is not cheap. So. A, a month, a, a whole year before I started my program, I knew I had to fundraise for my program. I guess just growing up in patriarchal societies, this is normal. Even if you have to, I, I only got this because uh, even if you have to kind of object to, to your dad, you have to have your own money. So it was natural for me to spend a year before having a program fundraising. After which, of course, I got enough funds to have three people to hire in the first year. 2005, I started with three. Today, uh, we have 70 people uh, because we have persistently kept on, on 
certain, uh, certain stories and certain themes. Energy, local, uh, local governments, corruption, and don't forget, the same way that you persist on certain topics, you will find donors who are persistent on certain topics. I would say this being uh, effective is, yes, investigative journalism cost, but I agree uh, that it also pays, if people see you follow up your stories, you're more likely to get donors interested to, uh, uh, to, to fund these stories because donors are also not interested in one-off uh, commercial media publication and never going back to it again. So it's proven to me to be a self-sustainable type of uh, uh, strategy. And um, third lesson, I, I always relied throughout these threatening campaigns, what saved me was an international and regional community that was a, a vital ally uh, in my work. Now, when I was attacked, uh, when I was attacked, I have a whole because uh, I work with NGOs, and this is to answer the next question, why, as, as an investigative journalist, we have to link up with NGOs? Because it is likely that we're going to be attacked if we're going to reveal these, uh, uh, in, uh, reveal or go after people's money. So, if that's going to happen, I want, who's going to be the one watching your back? We have to think, basically, I would say, uh, lesson four become more organized and organized crime. What do organized criminals do? They watch each other's back. If they're under threat, they're gonna call somebody. They're gonna call somebody in politics, call somebody in business, call somebody. I took this, uh, by investigating them, I took uh, literally uh, their method of, of how they watch each other's back. And today I have uh, uh, a network of, um, first my board wrote letters to ev everybody they could think of uh, when I was attacked, uh, the board members, uh, uh, the, 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 and then from then, um, 15 NGOs around the world, from Human Rights Watch to Amnesty International, uh, wrote requests to our Prime Minister to stop the campaign. Our Prime Minister went abroad in an economy forum, he got two questions, one about an economy uh, in Kosovo, second about this journalist that you're attacking, that your newspaper, that your funding is attacking. He came back after 12 days after that campaign saying, why? Uh, sending me a fixer, uh, and a fixer asked me, why did you make this an international issue? This is a, a, home, a home issue. You've, you create such a fuss internationally. Here, we stop the campaign, just shut up. Um, so, I, uh, and I didn't know, the person who made the question, we didn't even know, but the word had got around so much that these other journalists abroad became my allies. Journalists, human rights uh, people, and, and this is where I don't understand investigative journalists who are introverted and who say, well, the independence, we need to keep the independence. Actually, I, I treat uh, international organizations as a total ally, as a point of my existence, because I know that's the only thing that my, the people I am investigating are embarrassed of, their international reputation. And if, you, uh, and, and if one Googles their name, what can one find? So um, I, I want to say that in this methodology, I've taken the model, uh, I've been part of consortium of NGOs who, because we're dealing with the biggest challenge right now in Kosovo that we have is that we have a, ve a complex problems like in next, uh, the, to, to resolve our energy crisis for the next 50 years, uh, the World Bank has decided that the best way for Kosovo is to build another coal plant. They wanted to do this by uh, having no uh, social and environmental impact. So this is such a big problem uh, that we cannot resolve it just as a single media and single NGO. Yada, uh, we need to. Yes. We need to so move on here. what we and have done is we are part of what we call a civil society triangle, with grassroots groups who are filing complaints against uh, the World Bank on the way that the World Bank does resettlement. We are using think tanks. Think tanks are coming up with science. Uh, scientific details why Kosovo doesn't need a coal plant. It can rely on uh, the, uh, all sorts of other sources, but not to have yet another coal plant. And investigative journalism. We work together strategically uh, because it's such a huge problem to the point that, uh, for example, the grassroots have taken uh, World Bank to, to court. 
Uh, I've written articles about it, published in The Guardian, and in the end, uh, this, model of, of, this model of cooperation has been taken as an example by the Innovations for Successful Societies Princeton University uh, uh, lab that just analyzed well, uh, as, as a role model why this was so effective and how to use it in other post-conflict uh, areas. Uh, yeah, what are we, this, what are we this going is to do? Hold on a second. Uh, we've got to switch computers. and uh, So while we do that, I'd like to do some questions and answers while we uh, change our technology. So uh, Yetta can continue on if you have questions. Uh, th are there any questions for Yetta right now while we do our switch here? Any questions? Yes. There. Okay, go ahead. What is your business model? Is, do you survive only on donors or do you have subscription? Um, there was a point when there was UN administration in Kosovo. UN administration means that it had its board members in the public TV, and that's why it wasn't completely government-led. That's why I could get my show on air at all in the beginning. So when these programs started, uh, the popularity of them grew, and the public TV said, if you fundraise, I, I, had, I was running a bi-weekly program, they said you fundraise for one week, we, we pay for one week. So uh, it was 50-50 it was at that time. The public TV partly paid for the program, partly us. Today, when Kosovo is completely led locally, uh, they, they stopped funding. Uh, they, they always find reasons why they have no money to fund us, but we are completely relying today on on donor support, and this donor support means means that 50% of my time is uh, taken by basically NGO conferencing and uh, monitoring uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, monitoring and uh, and um, um, uh, all sorts of other things that are not investigative journalism. Uh, quick but question, this is the downside to the upside. Nobody messing with my investigations is not so bad. Me doing very NGO things. So the, the business model is about 20 different donors. That's the other uh, important thing. As varied donors as possible, but uh, relying on international. I, I want to ask uh, Roberta, do you have any observations about what she said while we get set to go with Alex? I mean, for sure, um, w I mean, we have seen, in particular, I have been seeing how these collaborative models are rising uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and there have been two or three processes that actually have been going on together. One is the understanding that uh, cooperating and joining forces while each actually does what it does best um, is, is a model for the future. Secondly, that what we all know now that investigative journalism has evolved from what you could say is the lone wolf uh, paradigm to collaborative investigations, especially in the case of corruption because Corruption, as we understand it in the 21st century, is by nature cross-border. It's international. Uh, there's no much more about local corruption. Um, and thirdly, in regards to the sustainability of the model, uh, this is the key. Uh, to gain independence, you have to, get, you have to have as many funding sources as you can, uh, whether it is in regards to subscriptions, whether it's in regards to advertisement for media, and it is in regards uh, to donors. What we see now in the future, and is starting to happen, is that these collaborative models are going to be uh, being orchestrated at an international scale. And uh, Transparency International just joined a consortium with the, uh, I mean, the, I don't know if you know it, the OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, to actually start doing investigations together where we know about the cases since the, since the outset, and while the investigative journalists do the investigations, so on and so forth, we prepare ourselves for a very, very solid and, um, I could even say, aggressive follow-up so that we ensure that uh, uh, the changes that we're looking for uh, take place. So, I mean, this is a fantastic example, the one of yours. So, Alice has been very patient, and we're going to move over to yours. Is your presentation ready? You set? Yeah, it's a bit. Of, yeah, but we'll we'll okay. we'll we'll proceed with that. Um, oh, okay. As a so, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and why you're here. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Yetta because she's she's basically done a great job with a uh, showing this pattern of uh, of uh, how should you uh, sustain your work, uh, and this is indeed a very profound and a clear message. Uh, although in in my case it was not particularly. 
um, useful, and I'll explain why, because it was a bit different. Um, I'll tell you a few words about myself, just briefly, so who I am and what I am. Um, I've been working a, as a journalist uh, since 1999 uh, back home in Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian, uh, although I have a Russian surname, it doesn't mean anything. Those of you who follow the news know that most of the people who are fighting on the Ukrainian side protecting our sovereignty and the integrity of our country against Russian aggression are speaking Russian as a mother tongue. Uh, so all this uh, crap, blah, 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 by Russia Today and other entities uh, claiming that we have a problem uh, with language and uh, some kind of a racial problem is uh, nothing to do with reality. Uh, but the, the, this is a different thing. Uh, my problem was, and uh, still is, uh, that I'm, I've, um, I worked as a war correspondent uh, for three years uh, back home uh, facing the uh, Crimean annexation and then the warfare in Donbass and then the other issues back there. But my problem was that I am a, uh, a business journalist in my past. I used to be a uh, business reporter for eight years. Uh, uh, I worked as a uh, uh, head of the business and uh, money uh, and banking section in the daily newspapers covering those issues back home. So when I traveled to the war, um, I could not skip the, uh, the chance of looking at war with the eyes of a business reporter, which in Ukraine is rarely done, unfortunately, or luckily to those who, who still do this reporting back there. Uh, and the thing was that um, in the middle of 2015, uh, when we were already in a stalemate, uh, with Russia and Russian-backed uh, forces in Donbass due to the Minsk process, uh, there was a, quite a lot of things to do in trying to understand what is basically happening on the front line uh, since there is no real fighting. And um, uh, the, the coverage... Um, and the coverage of those Ukrainian events was not really active since the Baltsevo operation. Those of you who follow Ukraine may probably know what I'm talking about. This is a large railroad hub uh, in uh, Donetsk Oblast of Ukraine, and this was the last major operation uh, on the front line uh, back home that happened in the winter of uh, 2015, so pretty long time ago. And since then, the, the demarcation line has most have, have mostly remained the same. Uh, but still, if there is nothing that is moving to or fro, it doesn't mean that anything is happening. And that was the, the point when I got into a story which basically led me here. And we, I have a little a sorry for that. I'm not trying to pop up, but I, I just have a problem with the computer here. But yeah. So the thing is, um, what worked with Yetta the, uh, was, uh, was fundraising, and uh, was a public support for things that she, that, she, that she was doing apart from the governmental resistance. In my case, it was a bit tricky because we still had to, um, um, to dig into stories that were very unpopular um, in the circles of military, the intelligence, uh, the law enforcement, and the public as well, because yes, indeed, we are still at war with Russia, and the hybrid warfare goes on, and the informational provocations uh, uh, from the Russian Federation, including all those uh, weird uh, uh, so-called uh, outlets like Russia Today and uh, whatnot. Uh, so uh, we're in the middle of this, of, this, of this fight with Russia and unpopular news, in particular those who are um, showing the problems that we are having on the front line, of course, are not welcomed. And so basically those who, could, who supported me and, and still support me, now I'm not speaking about my, my partners and my friends in Germany who invited me and uh, who pro probably saved my life. Uh, but I'm now speaking about the, 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 the community back home. So the strongest support is from the families of the deceased guys uh, um, uh, whose deaths were basically a, a subject a, of my investigation. So what happened there? I will just show you briefly a few, um, a few um, pictures that would make you understand what we're talking about. So this thing is a very open uh, uh, is a is a very open source. It has nothing to do with the insider stuff I was digging into. We'll get to that later. This is just a map shown on an official website of Ukrainian border guards. You can Google that dpsu.gov.ua. 
Uh, thing is that it shows the official uh, crossing points of the Ukra Ukrainian national border. We all know what a border is. Luckily, U uh, Europe doesn't have it anymore inside uh, the Schengen zone. But well, we are still we are still here, and we have uh, we have the border with Russia. We have the border with the European countries. Uh, but the thing is that if you look at that attentively. Um, you will see a strange gap here, right? So you, you don't see the whole national border covered with those. Those green dots, they basically mean that the border uh, control points are free to cross and it shows the situation like a traffic jams, uh, nothing specific. But what do you see here? You see Donetsk and Lugansk over there. Uh, and they're in the middle of a uh, bloody nowhere <laughs> being a part of the uh, uh, Russian-controlled enclaves uh, and a gray zone, uh, as I call it. And I, um, you see a, 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 a quite a long uh, stretch of a Russian border over there. And of course, we don't have control to that part of the border because Russians are there. And then there is this big gray zone covering this occupied territories. But then there is no other mean of official control on that border as we don't see those green spots. Uh, probably you get what I'm saying. So, uh, of course, there is some border. There is a demarcation line over there. But this is by no means controlled in an official, transparent way. And the result of that is a pretty interesting trading activity that is happening there most of the people in this room know what a war zone is. Uh, li people living in Balkans, living in Mexico, elsewhere, um, well, they smile because they know. For us Ukrainian, it was a piece of a news. Um, and this piece of a news was there for years. Um, so I'll just, I'll just show you a couple of pics, like what it looked like. This is an interesting one. This is a, a railway wagon. Uh, an old one, uh, a Russian one, it, it has RGD, it means uh, Russian Railroad um, wagon. It was transporting coal. Uh, and the coal trading uh, remained there until the most recent time. Um, and I, but it was not advertised by the, uh, by the uh, Ukrainian government, but it was there. Uh, but within those, um, those I... Um, trains um, that were transporting coal from the occupied territories, there were quite a few things that were uh, pretty different from the official shipment that was supposed to be taking in and uh, out. For instance, while well, we see this little, uh, I'll show a little fragment of a video here. It was uh, filmed by a guy who was my first source for information when I started digging into the story. He was murdered two days after I've recorded the first interview with him. Uh, 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 those are these uh, five bags that we see here. You see them, right? Uh, okay. So um, they, they were transported by this train. Uh, the, the value, the price of a um, shipment that was transported by the train it was supposed to be one million grivnas, uh, which is a, a something like... Uh, uh, hell, it's not too much. Uh, yeah, something like three um, uh, hundred thousand uh, um, euro. Uh, but the price of those bags bearing uh, what we what we have in them was the gold and silver works. Uh, well, some some very cheap looking and pretty ugly looking, in my view. Uh, some orthodox symbols were used in the churches, but these are goods for trade. And uh, the, they, they have gold and silver, and the, the price for that is three times higher than the price of a coal train. And this is the thing that we call smuggling, which uh, is a little bit weird, because de jure it is not a smuggling. We still have, so if you will look at this Ukrainian border, uh, we, we still see that this is a part of Ukraine officially. Uh, but still, uh, de facto, this is a place that is not more controlled by Ukrainian authorities, although um, is, um, they, they still try to, to, uh, to uh, kind of uh, uh, stick to the Minsk process of reintegration of the, ter the territories, which is a bit uh, hard to do. Um, 
various different kind of goods were transported and were circulating in this area. Uh, for instance, it was a uh, it was coal taken by the cars uh, through the checkpoints, which was uh, and the the local uh, militias and the local uh, military were. Um, um, uh, basically getting cash from that. And this is the most recent piece of news that I love. Uh, it was just the, the, the other day I took a screenshot of one of our websites. So this is a, um, uh, um, uh, according to official information from my authorities, uh, Ukrainian authorities, this is a Stradivari uh, violin. <laughs> uh, it, it was indeed, according to the, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, footage that the government was able to produce, it was a real... Uh, um, uh, Stradivari violin produced uh, somewhere in a uh, uh, seventeen uh, uh, seventeen thirty Anno Domini. So, so, Alex, I had a quick question in yours. So, you're covering the smuggling, and it's smuggling uh, through various parts of the porous border. Yes. And you have sources, and then your sources begin to die. So, you have two investigations going on. Is that correct? Well, it looks like that. It looks like that. I started over with a trying to understand what a picture of the trading with the occupied territory is like and what is a, um, a financial side of war. And the problem was that uh, I was still doing it in the midst of the war, basically. Uh, even in a hybrid way uh, as it is, it is still a war. So there were no interested party in, uh, in going on with that investigation, apart from the, those guys who are lo no longer with us. The problem is, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, well, so we got the, and this is another different item. Uh, most of you will probably recognize this uh, pieces of technology. Not too modern, but rather, rather recognizable. So this is a, one of the things that was uh, uh, traveling in between those, uh, uh, those enclaves. Uh, and I, well, in a, in a normal vehicle um, like that, um, the problem was that no one have ever reported on a uh, weaponry leakages uh, back home. And we have a huge problem indeed, and my group uh, was able to collect some of the evidence of a pretty high scale. Uh, uh, armory, weaponry, and uh, the rounds of ammunition being leaked from the military bases back home, um, which was uh, uh, happening in at least two criminal cases. It uh, connected to the people involved in at least two criminal cases I've been following. Um, so uh, these are the rounds of ammunition. Well, and. Um, the problem was, so I'll, I'll try to get to the, I can't, I can't tell the story for hours. This is a pretty long story. And we I have five minutes. Yeah, we have just five <laughs> minutes. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so th thank you, Brandt. Um, uh, the thing is that um, what is a, um, a lesson? Uh, well, Jetta was great in that, having the lessons. I have my own lesson here. Uh, you, um, you cannot stop. Even if you want to, uh, being a journalist, there's a thing when you cannot simply quit. And you can become whatever you are. You can become a writer, a farmer. Um, uh, you can become whatever you want. But you will still be accounted as a journalist. And you will ever, 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 you will never, ever be able to uh, stop being a witness to the things you have once seen and documented. And the problem is that you have to live with that. And Every one of us here has to live with that, we do. Uh, my problem was that I could not get a, 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 a help in my home country due to the problems that my home country is still having there. But the more severe problems were having people not being journalists. As, a, as being a journalist with a, uh, with a pretty sufficient record of publications back home, I was able to apply to you. Uh, um, different media organizations. I was refused of their support. Finally, I found a help in the Hamburger Stiftung, uh, which is a hamburger organization that deals with uh, those weirdies like myself. Um, but the thing is that there are much more people who were not, who were unfortunately not able to um, to apply for that support. Uh, and um, um, the problem was that the uh, the second and the last. 
um, lesson that I learned from the story is that you, in the transition country, I cannot judge Germany, U.S., or Britain, uh, uh, even the Balkans, uh, but I can judge, judge the countries of the post-Soviet Union as I worked uh, there quite a long time. And uh, in, in those countries, as uh, Russia, Georgia, Armenia, Russia, of course, and Ukraine as well, you just cannot let the law enforcement do their job silently. Because what the thing that you will get, uh, for sure, you will get a destroyed evidence. Uh, we have seen it in Sheremet case, uh, the guy, the journalist, uh, who was uh, murdered in a strange way last year in Kiev last summer. Um, and that was this OCCPR investigation that showed that there were uh, missing evidence on uh, one of the surveillance cameras in the local shops where his car was uh, blown up in the morning. So the, the, the surveillance from night when the bomb was probably installed was missing. The same situation I have faced in my own case because uh, we, my group, uh, and by my group I mean my sources and, and the other people who support me in uh, gathering the information because we are still on the way to get to the murderers. But the thing is that in my particular case the evidence that was a uh, uh, there would be probably, uh, absolutely for sure, that would be used by any uh, police investigative authority, any investigative authority all over the world, which is the digital data uh, um, stored on a, such a devices like this as my personal computer. Uh, in, the, in my case, the, the data on the personal computer of my deceased source was destroyed, erased, and it was only by the... Um, by the uh, work of our group were, that we were able to, um, to restore this data, at least partially. Uh, this is my source for information uh, whom I met on the front line in August uh, 2015, and uh, his name is Andrew Galushchenko. Uh, he, he was a volunteer that was hired by the government, uh, was actually uh, uh, provoked by the government to join uh, their uh, anti-smuggling campaign back home. Uh, and he was the guy who was killed two days after the first and the last recorded interview that he ever did, and this was an interview with myself. Um, later on, I was blamed on being a, uh, the, the one who provoked his death. Uh, I was told that I am the next target for the murderers. I was said that there is a plot against me. There were a lot of things. There were direct threats as well with the weapons in their arms. This is just the moment when I'm interviewing the guy. Um, in two days, he won't be with us anymore. Uh, the problem is, I'll just, um, I'll, I just want to add one thing. Um, the story that started with the interview on the front line of a business journalist, a former business journalist, and then a TV guy like myself, um, ended up in a pretty long uh, turmoil that affected me personally. Um, but the thing is that from the very, from the very start, it was clear that uh, you, can, you cannot stop. Uh, and it, it is not even your choice, and it is not something brave that you are doing, and this is not something really cool that you are sticking to a story against the Lords. But you just cannot not do it. You have the evidence collected, and when your source is dead, and you are left there with hours of interviews with him and some collected data, you just have to do it something. And this is just doing your job. So uh, that's it. The, pro uh, the thing is, I wanted just to show you a few pictures that led us to understanding that this is not a case two, of... Two minutes. Yeah, yeah just okay. thank you, thank you, Brand. So I, I just wanted to show you uh, the things that the local law enforcement, in this case it was a military prosecutor's office, was trying to um, basically hide from us um, and with the assistance of the other law enforcement that was uh, erasing the data on the gadgets of the, of the deceased guys. So uh, this is my source. This is the guy who was killed the next day after him, uh, airborne captain, uh, 80s brigade. His name is Volodymyr Kian. Uh, he was the first guy to, um, to claim to, uh, to, to start an, an independent inquiry into the death of the guy who was dead the other day. That is my murder source. Uh, his gadgets were, were also cleared off any information on them. Uh, veteran of Iraq. 
Uh, so that is he. That is the guy uh, that was dead uh, in a different uh, location, uh, but uh, as I found out from the gadget of my deceased source, um, the Andrew was also um, trying to um, inquire into his, um, to make an inquiry into his death. Uh, this is the guy who was killed in Mariupol just last summer, uh, um, an instructor of a karate, uh, a former uh, Marine, and a very well-known uh, soldier uh, and a commander in the military circles. Uh, this is uh, just an ordinary civilian uh, who was um, just passing by somewhere when this, probably the smuggling operation was holding. Uh, this is, I'm sorry for that, this is his body in a coffin and the police has claimed that there was no beating up, there was no violence against him, but we just see his body in the coffin and we see his arms and his face. Uh, uh, and we see that he was bitten before the death. His death was never investigated. Um, I'm, very, I'm very sorry to say all that because I'm a patriot of Ukraine. We are here in the patriotic house. Um, and, uh, the, but the thing is that reporting uneasy news for the home country, even in the state of war, is important because otherwise we will just stay there with the ineffective uh, law enforcement there. It's just, uh, uh, just not doing his job. This is the other guy. The official reason for his dad uh, that the police and the military prosecutors said that was a suicide. Uh, that's indeed funny uh, because he was killed by two bullets in his head and a hand grenade exploding in his hand. But uh, neither police nor the prosecutors would, uh, um, do not, would, uh, would um, argue, uh, would, would, st would start an inquiry into his death, claiming it being a suicide. Uh, basically, that's it. Uh, we got to go on. Thank you for that. And, uh, Thank you, Alex. Thank um, you very much. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll finish all the stories we started. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Do we have any questions? I know we're late in the day. Um, I want to thank the two reporters particularly. Can I just add to this presentation? I yes. think it's the most challenging thing to do. The fact that all of these killed people were Ukrainians killed by Ukrainians. So to investigate in war time your own side, killing your own side, I think that's, I mean, the ultimate um, kind of betrayal. And I think you're doing a great job uh, of exposing this. But I can, I can see just no way you could have uh, stayed alive, not, not coming to Hamburg. So thanks, Hamburg, for having <laughs> you. Um, I'm glad you're out of there. But it is key information that I thought not everybody could get. I didn't get it when I heard your story first, that Ukrainians killing Ukrainians. Yes, yes it's totally different. We'll wrap up, Roberto. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of information. Um, I think you've given an idea of the need for NGOs and investigative journalists to work together in, in some ways. I think you had a, maybe a very clear case for that. Um, any final thoughts on this? We'll get to the end. Yeah, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot to, to you too. I mean, I mean, bravery and heroism of investigative journalists uh, is a, something that every single day, uh, you know, makes living worth it. Um, I believe that uh, I mean, as we have seen in this particular case and in your case too, is that uh, corruption and violence go hand in hand. And when an investigative journalist is trying to uncover corruption, basically what he's doing, he's attacking vested interests from extremely dangerous people, from Ukraine to Kosovo to Mexico to Honduras and many other places. Once an investigative journalist or a group of investigative journalists try to uncover corruption, most often they pay with their lives. And the most, um, uh, the most um, you know, horrendous thing is that uh, the impunity around those killings is usually at the highest, meaning that for every 10 investigative journalists that are killed, potentially only one case may be solved, if we're lucky. So in terms of this panel about how we can actually make uh, investigative journalism sustainable, uh, it's about talking of you know, life and death and how a global community needs to be strengthened in order to make every single case so visible that there is no denial about the complicity of governments, politicians, presidents in keeping these, uh, these deaths with total impunity. Thank you. Any final words out there? Thanks so much. Um, and I want to again admire the reporters here in this incredible work. Let's applaud them, please. <laughs>